Have you ever read Harry Potter? So, Harry dies at the end. Spoilers. I love that bit. It's guaranteed to make anyone unwise enough to share that they're somehow experiencing Harry Potter for the first time regret ever talking to you, while also barely qualifying as a spoiler. I have read other books, leave me alone. So, for reasons the uncovering of which I'll leave to my biographers, I've decided to talk about spoilers. I am fairly spoiler averse, which is something I've discovered about myself when I briefly experimented with watching anime when I was a teenager, and my former best friend, upon learning this, said something to the effect of, Oh cool, did you get to the bit where Jiraiya dies yet? I just prefer to go into certain kinds of experiences relatively blind. This is not a unique sentiment. Most people I know feel this way about different bits of media to different extents, but I also find that there are people who don't particularly care about spoilers, and often seem kind of hostile towards the idea of using simple spoiler warnings. You know who you are. So before we get started here, I'm just going to quickly run you through why having a baseline level of spoiler manners is good, actually. You know, just for the sake of those people. This isn't the point of the video, I promise. Just bear with me. First, it's just polite. Second, it's not that hard to do. I understand it's not always easy to tell what some people may or may not consider a spoiler, but that's fine. Just use your best judgement and show a bit of effort. You can't make everyone happy, but the least you can do is not go out of your way to upset people. It occurs to me that some people I know will see this and think I'm doing a call-out. This is not a call-out. You're fine, don't worry. Third, um, who the bleep do you think you are? What makes you think you can decide for other people how they experience media? Look. Blatantly ignoring basic spoiler manners isn't an act of rebellion against spoiler culture. All it does is remove the tools that help people make informed decisions about which conversations they want to be a part of. What you're doing is depriving people of choice. I didn't have a choice. The white phosphorus scene in Spec Ops The Line is possibly the most well-known bit of explicitly anti-war video game storytelling out there. It is the defining moment of the game, a scene so effective at getting its message across it gets under your skin. It will stick in your memory like moist dough. I've been getting into baking lately. In this scene, the player character Martin Walker decides to use mortars with white phosphorus ammunition to clear out an enemy encampment, only to discover that the place you've just war crimed all over with illegal chemical weapons was full of civilians, and you have horrifically murdered all of them. For Spec Ops, this is the big transformative moment. It is so iconic and memorable that I bet some of you haven't even noticed that the footage I've been showing you is from Call of Duty. Now, why would I do that? Who knows? Don't think about it too much. I'm bringing this up because there is one fairly prominent piece of criticism that I often see levelled at Spec Ops, and this scene in particular, that I want to talk about. It's the idea that the game criticising the player for participating in Walker's atrocities rings hollow because it doesn't let the player, um, not do that. You have to bomb civilians with chemical weapons to progress the story. You don't have a choice in the matter. You can clearly see the huddled masses before hitting the trigger, and you can try to say no and try to avoid it any way you can, but you can't. Because your main character is a homicidal maniac and there's nothing you can do to stop him, short of turning the game off. Maybe I'm a cold emotionless bastard, but I did not feel an ounce of guilt about that. I find this criticism kind of baffling, not least because it picks a very strange place from which to demand player agency. That scene doesn't exist in isolation, it is a direct reference to Death From Above, an aesthetically and mechanically similar scene in Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare in which you control an airstrike operator as he bombs the absolute bleep out of a small village. 
But I don't think I've ever heard anyone demand the option not to participate in this scene. Why is that? It's not like Death From Above doesn't carry its fair share of anti-war messaging. Spec Ops doesn't have a monopoly on that. In fact, the only really major difference, besides the civilian targets and the use of weapons banned by the Geneva Convention, is that after the bombing is over, Modern Warfare just kind of moves on while Spec Ops makes you take a very unpleasant walk through the aftermath. And this detail is enough to not only break the characters experiencing it, it also very much breaks the player's understanding of the characters. It also breaks the game's um, genre. A lot has been said about Spec Ops in terms of its criticism of modern military, but I feel that framing it purely as an anti-war game would be inaccurate. Modern Warfare is an anti-war game, sort of. But Spec Ops is also an anti-war game game. The point isn't just to say that uh, war crimes are bad, I guess. It's to try and challenge the stories and imagery that work to normalise these atrocities on a cultural level. Coincidentally, last year's soft reboot of Modern Warfare features white phosphorus as an unlockable multiplayer killstreak item. Just thought I would point that out. The makers of Spec Ops did this by creating a war game that ends up collapsing under the weight of its genre. The fact that you don't get choice not to use white phosphorus is kind of the point. You don't have a choice because Martin Walken didn't have a choice. And Walker didn't have a choice because the unnamed AC-130 operator didn't have a choice. 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 I didn't have a choice. There's always a choice. None of them have a choice because they're all stuck within a genre in which similar actions are routinely depicted without any regard for the implications of these depictions and are then expected to be taken on face value. For the record, if you're typing out a comment right now to inform me that the unnamed gunship operator does in fact have a name and I didn't research the lore of Call of Duty thoroughly enough? You're a nerd, and I don't want to be your friend. Spec Ops doesn't criticise the player for participating in Walker's fictional crimes. It criticises them for doing so uncritically, without understanding the weight of what they're being asked to do, for thinking that this... Good kill, good kill. ...is normal. And the game isn't particularly subtle about any of this. So what kind of a mindset could the criticism about a lack of choice undermining the game be coming from? Well, I put a bit of thought into it, and I think I might have a suggestion. That spoilers kind of killed it for me. Even though I was exposed to only the vaguest sense of what happens in this game, it colored my expectations the wrong way. I saw the Yahtzee Zero punctuation review that kind of colored it like a survival horror game, which isn't really what Spec Ops is, and then I read a Rock Paper Shotgun review that made parallels to Bioshock that, again, wasn't really what it turned out to be, and I knew there was something involving a white phosphorus scene. I didn't know the context of it, but I knew it was coming, and that really killed a lot of this game's surprise. And a bait and switch for players who weren't expecting really heavy-handed stuff is um, a big part of the appeal of this game, I think. Most players would have no reason to reject the use of white phosphorus in the same way that they would have no reason to reject Call of Duty's airstrikes. The power fantasy of the modern military shooter demands that you don't question the premise too much, and in return, you are not confronted with the implied consequences of your in-game actions. Spec Ops is an effective criticism of the genre because it breaks this rule. It's a pretty great bait and switch, the only problem being that the trick doesn't really work if you go into the game already expecting a twist. In other words, for the game's message to land the way I believe it was intended to, spoilers need to be absent. If you know that the game is trying to be critical from the start, you approach it a bit more, well, critically. You break the demands of the genre by thinking for yourself and end up playing a very different game. Unless, of course, you're one of those people who always think critically, even when viewing media explicitly designed to discourage that, in which case, good for you. You win. You are, in fact, better than me. Have a cookie. It's actually really good. I got the recipe from Tasty, 
I'm going to link to it. And... Okay, so what's my point? Am I going to spend the whole video attacking people who I think understood the game wrong for not avoiding spoilers diligently enough? No, no, of course not. Listen, art isn't some monolithic entity that contains a preset meaning within it. The way we derive meaning from art is largely experiential and will always draw from your pre-existing knowledge and expectations. Your readings of media will tend to be unique to you, based on things like your worldview, your media diet, or, and this is the important one for our purposes, the information that you have going in. You cannot divorce a text from its context. Spec Ops was created to criticise a then-dominant genre that is no longer quite as popular as it used to be. It has, in this sense, not aged all that great. Or well, maybe it has? Who's to say? My reading of it could not exist without an understanding of the media and environment that the game was originally released into and would most likely have been affected by any prior knowledge of its events. In this way, spoilers can, in a very real sense, change the meaning of the narrative. So, those of you with fancy literature degrees might have already noticed that I'm talking about paratextuality. I don't have a fancy literature degree. Um, I had to Google all this. My degrees are useful. I'll be getting into a bunch of weird theory that I'm not sure I fully understand. So let's define some terms first. If Spec Ops, the line, the game is the text and the shooters that it references and criticizes are the intertext, then paratext is the connective tissue between the two and what forms a large chunk of the game's context. Stop me if this gets confusing. Literary theorist Gerard Jeanette described paratext as texts that prepare us for other texts. They carry information that frames and contextualizes the text. A blurb on the back of a book is a paratext, for example, and so are the book's advertising and promotional materials, the internet discussions surrounding it, the reviews, even tiny details like font choices and cover design. Paratexts are a pretty big deal in media interpretation because they form the reader's entry point into the text. Jonathan Gray, a lecturer in media studies at the University of Wisconsin, notes in his book on the subject, Paratexts tell us what to expect, and in doing so, they shape the reading strategies that we will take with us into the text. They provide the all-important early frames through which we will examine, react to, and evaluate textual consumption. Okay, so, why am I bringing up all this boring nonsense? Well, it's mostly because that's what spoilers are. A pretty straightforward example of paratext, and like all paratext, they frame and contextualize the texts. They are a way of extracting meaning from work, and that means that their presence can pretty drastically change one's interpretation of whatever it is that they spoil. Case study time! <laughs> you know, just in case you were afraid I might stay on point for longer than five minutes. In December last year, I went to see the somewhat mediocre Marvel Cinematic Universe film Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. A few days before going to the cinema, I came across a small spoiler in the form of a tweet by Pink News linking to an article titled Rise of Skywalker Makes History with Gay Kiss. So naturally, I assumed the article was talking about Finn and Poe, and I went into the theatre fully expecting John Boyega and Oscar Isaac to make out on the big screen. Now, as we all know, the actual history defining gay kiss was half a second of unnamed extras doing a quick smooch. Finn spent the entire film running around shouting, right. and Poe? Uh, was Poe in this? Yes. Huh. But none of that detracted from the experience of watching the film for the first time, thinking the second best shit that never happened was actually going to become canon. And let me tell you, you could cut the sexual tension there with a laser sword. So I accidentally ended up reading a bunch of subtext into the film, which, if it was there, it was probably only designed to queerbait fanfiction writers. But it also meant that I paid a lot more attention to the interactions between the two characters, which ended up being the most genuine and outright enjoyable part of the film. The characters got to have that much more depth and a different kind of an emotional investment in the proceedings, and later, when new straight love interests were introduced for each of them, may be a bit of an inner conflict even. No, seriously, 
go back and watch the film again if you can bear it. Finn and Poe have some genuine moments. Did I really just recommend people watch The Rise of Skywalker? Obviously, I'm working with a fairly loose definition of a spoiler here because I had inf incomplete information going in, but that doesn't really change my point. That headline, that tiny little paratext that barely qualifies as a spoiler was all it took to shift my expectations going into the text, to completely recontextualize the relationship between two major characters and to change how I understood and enjoyed the film. For the better, I'd like to add. Since paratexts have considerable power to amplify, reduce, erase, or add meaning, much of the textuality that exists in the world is paratext-driven. A text cannot exist without paratexts. Which, for our purposes, means that just like how certain interpretations of texts cannot exist in the presence of spoilers, some cannot exist in their absence. But what am I supposed to do with this information? Are spoilers good, actually? Have I been doing myself a disservice by avoiding them all this time? Should everyone be going out of their way to spoil more bad films for themselves in order to improve the experience? I would love to definitively answer the question of whether spoilers are good or bad for you so you know which opinion is correct, believe me. But there was something else that caught my attention when I went to see the Star War. Something rather strange that popped up on the screen just before the film started. A thing that complicates that question somewhat. A spoiler warning. No, it wasn't a warning that the film would spoil itself. Don't be ridiculous. It was more of a public service announcement, like those ads on the bus that tell you to give up your seat for elderly passengers. A friendly reminder not to spoil the film for people who might not have seen it yet. It was a short bit of text that flashed up on the screen briefly before the film started, in inconsequential detail encouraging thoughtful behaviour. Nothing to write a 30 minute video essay about. So why did I find it so out of place? Maybe it's because it's really weird and manipulative. No, that's not it. There's something that feels a bit off-putting about a media company like Disney, reminding people to adhere to spoiler etiquette. And it's not that I feel like there's anything wrong with asking people to be thoughtful. I literally did that at the beginning of this video. And now that I've acknowledged that, you're not allowed to call me a hypocrite. It has more to do with what this spoiler warning actually means. Strap in people, it's time to do some textual analysis. The spoiler warning being the text. And just like with every text, the meaning is derived from the paratextual information attached to it. You know, the context. I am not the first to point out that companies like Disney have a financial stake in spoiler avoidance. Jim Sterling made a video about this in April and Damn it, Jim, I was just getting around to writing that bit. Why did you have to do me a dirty like that? Fine, roll the clip. What our collective spoiler fetish, and it is a fetish, has done is increase pressure to see a movie as soon as humanly possible so nothing can be ruined. In essence, millions of people do not go out and see movies they go out and get spoiler vaccinations. They want to expose themselves to the film as soon as they can to be inoculated against the following discourse. And what's the most important time for a movie's release? Opening weekend. Is it any surprise that Disney routinely smashes box office records? They have the nerd properties, the fandom culture, and spoiler obsession on their side. They have you packing those cinemas. Or they did before, you know, all the disease. But it's not just about getting people into a state where wanting to have watched The Avengers carries more weight in deciding to go see it than whether you actually want to watch the bloody thing or not. A large part of it is just branding. Brands seek to infuse specific meanings and associations into their products through careful and deliberate use of paratext. It's the job of marketers to paint their products, in this case a film, in a very specific light to adjust the audience's expectations and steer the conversations surrounding it. Brand integrity demands a tight control over how a product is perceived by consumers, lest it loses its value in the eyes of investors. So, naturally, the ability of media properties to control as much of the meaning that people extract from them as possible, to only allow specific, intended readings to come through, would be a priority. And if a text cannot exist without paratext, and some interpretations of text cannot exist without spoilers, then that means that, among other things, 
Minimizing the audience's access to spoilers can help restrict the range of interpretations said audience can derive from your product. Here's the thing though, Disney doesn't just own the Star Wars license. Their franchises account for a third of all box office revenue. Their streaming service was valued at $100 billion within months of launch as it slowly starves its competitors of content, a good chunk of which it owns. This one entity has an unprecedented amount of control over much of our entertainment, the means through which we access it, and the ways we process and interpret it. So, you'll understand if I can't help but read that little spoiler message in the theatre less as a simple reminder of good manners, and more as an attempt to weaponize manners, in order to help further cement the company's dominance over the media landscape. Now, I don't want to get too much into the chicken and egg argument about whether corporate interests created the culture of avoiding spoilers, or have just adapted to benefit from it. Either way, this spoiler culture has kind of become one of the central pillars of how we consume media, and that's a thing, I guess. I just can't help but feel that a part of that conversation has been lost in the process. Something about the way we talk about spoilers has become really strange and unhealthy. You know. Spoilers, as in the thing that spoils media. We can't seem to get away from that angle, can we? And it's not just the dogmatic spoiler avoidance that's the problem. I've done the bare minimum of research needed to make myself feel like I'm not just pulling random words out of a hat, and even the few academic papers I found on the topic do this. Spoilers make you enjoy stories more, actually, they quip obnoxiously, like your least favourite child at the dinner table. That vague enjoyment framework is seemingly pre-baked into the concept. This fascinating example of parasexuality, what could be a helpful tool for examining how we interpret and understand art, reduced to an endlessly repeating shouting match about whether it ruins Marvel films or not. So, no, as you might have guessed, I do not think that spoilers inherently ruin media. And I do not think they particularly enhance it either. They simply create different ways of interpreting it, and in doing so they achieve something much more interesting. They provide choice. Back in 2006, Jonathan Gray teamed up with Jason Battelle in order to try and understand the way fans of the show Lost respond to spoilers. Oh yeah, I remember Lost. I don't. Never watched it. The study took the form of an online questionnaire, and while the sample, less than 200 predominantly North American participants, was by their own admission way too limited to produce any meaningful general conclusions, it did hint at some interesting trends and attitudes. More specifically, it provided some insights into why the people that go out of their way to seek out spoilers would want to do that. With this show especially, which I understand to have been fairly reliant on elaborate twists, why ruin the suspense for yourself? Well, for a bunch of reasons as it turns out. A big one was down to the nature of the show itself. Driven heavily by a central mystery and presented as more of a puzzle to solve than a straightforward narrative, many fans saw spoilers as a piece of the puzzle, engaging as much with the meta-narrative of solving the show as they did with the text of the show itself. Then there were the fans that straight up weren't interested in the suspense, those more invested in the how than the what. People who found that knowing the answers to some questions opened up other, more interesting ones. Some people found that knowing what happens in the plot freed them up to focus on the technical and the artistic aspects of the show, the flourishes of writing and storytelling, details that can get lost with a strictly plot-centric, spoiler-free approach to viewing the show. And sometimes it all boils down to an openly antagonistic relationship between the fans and the creators, a giant cat and mouse game that is played between the producers and the audience. The consumption of spoilers can be almost an act of rebellion, a way to reclaim ownership of a paratext closely guarded by the author. It's easy enough to see why people choose to avoid spoilers. There is a sense of finality to them that is on its own quite unnerving. 
Once a piece of media has been spoiled for you, that's it. The spoiler has permanently become a part of how you approach the text. You have lost some of your ability to enjoy the story on your own terms, to pick and choose for yourself which paratexts you want to frame that important first experience of the text, or at least one of the few paratexts that you can have any amount of control over. You can never regain that ability short of finding a way to scrub your brain of the unwanted information. You have been, at least to some extent, deprived of choice. Choice is kind of an illusory concept. It's the first thing that conservatives tend to bring out when they defend the American healthcare system, for example. And I mean, it's not like it's wrong to want choices, it's just very easy to forget that sometimes for one person to have their choices, someone else's need to be taken away. Poor people need to die without adequate healthcare in order for rich people to choose their provider on the free market. It's power dynamics, something that needs to be understood by anyone involved in any political conversation if you want that conversation to remain coherent. Um, I, I tried to leave politics out of this one. Please come back, I'll stop now, I promise. So the... Um much lower stakes question isn't are spoilers good or bad, it's what are the power dynamics inherent to any given conversation about spoilers? The question is, who gets to exercise their choices as to how we experience media? And the answer is Disney. Obviously it's Disney. And for some people, embracing spoilers holds the key to regaining that choice. Spoilers can help us engage with media in ways the authors might not have even accounted for, to reclaim ownership of the paratexts that form our entry point into media. Spoilers, just by existing, regardless of whether you engage with them or not, create a choice in how we approach media, noticeably changing how we experience it in the process. While a good story can be a well-told tale, it can also be a puzzle and a challenge, an object to be marvelled at, a familiar space, a complex network to be mapped, and a site to stimulate both discussion and the proliferation of textuality. Our choice of which paratexts to consume and which paratexts to create lets us work out what we want to do with any given tale before us. Thank you for subjecting yourself to this. A special thanks to Jess and Natalie who have kindly provided voice lines. I've linked to their channels below. If you would like to help me develop a healthier release schedule, there's a link to my Patreon page in the description. Unfortunately, I'm not in a place where I can release videos regularly, so I've set the Patreon payments up to be on a per video basis. Patrons get access to the scripts as well as my research notes, and they get to watch the videos a couple of days in advance. Anyway, bye!